Okay, so I'm here with Katie, who is the Director of Performance Nutrition at Northwestern. Um, so Katie, can you please describe your role as Director of Performance Nutrition at Northwestern? What does this entail? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so basically, our, um, my job involves running the performance nutrition program, um, which includes uh, multiple dietitians, dietetic interns, volunteers, work study students. Um, the program that we run kind of has three main pillars to it. Um, the first pillar is the clinical work that we do, um, clinical sports nutrition. So that involves um, all of the individual counseling that we do with athletes, looking at lab values, looking at body composition, looking at weights, um, looking at um, just kind of behaviors around how we can help counsel athletes to kind of align their performance nutrition or performance goals with their nutrition habits. Um, the second pillar is all of the education that we do. So the in-person education that we do with um, groups and teams around specific themes um, that we're trying to get um, teams to, to think about and adapt. It involves the education that we do um, through social media and through newsletters and kind of passive education. Um, it involves the education that we do for our coaching staffs and for our athletic trainers and for our sports um, performance coaches as nutrition re relates to their disciplines. Um, it also involves um, the cooking classes um, and the, the life skills that we um, help our athletes develop. So our education component is really huge. Um, it's a really fun part of our job. Um, and then the third component would be the food service aspect. So that would be the running and managing of the fueling station, um, procuring all the foods, doing inventory, making sure that they're being stored safely, served safely, um, helping with menu design up in Nona Joe's or helping with menu design um, with our athletes um, on the road or with catered meals or things like that. So that's kind of a snapshot of the breadth of um, performance nutrition. And we have a great team here to help get all that stuff done. And we really love um, working with our athletes in all those capacities. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So in general, like how should a college athlete fuel his or her body and what are the big do's and don'ts? Awesome. Um, it's, that's a really big question. I think um, in general, um, the college athlete really needs to consider their performance goals. Um, so kind of defining the win, if you will, is the win improved strength, is the, is the win improve, improved stamina, is the win improved speed, is it, is it mental strength or, um, you know, reaction time or, you know, kind of what is it? And then being ready to align their behaviors with whatever that is. So um, I would say, you know, there's some things that, that sometimes stand in the way of that. And I think that you maybe will get to that in some of your other questions, but there's some um, previous education that they may have received from reliable or not reliable sources. There is, um, you know, the mental space that you have to put yourself in, in terms of, am I willing to do this regardless of how my physical body might change? Um, the performance is king, then aesthetics is not um, always aligning in that way. Um, and so I would say the biggest do is to get your mind right about what you're trying to do. And if it's performance, then be willing to um, work really hard to change behavior um, to align align what you're doing with your with your goals. I would say a big don't is um, trying to grasp at straws of from unreliable nutrition information from Instagram, from BuzzFeed, from everywhere else, trying to look for the quick fix, um, trying to, you know, have it all, if you will, in terms of the aesthetic nature of, of whatever it is you're trying to achieve your body, but also the performance component, because those things don't always align. Um, I would say those are probably the, the don'ts. Awesome. Okay. Um, how do you treat athletes differently depending on their sport and their gender? 
Um, I think you absolutely have to look at the demands of the sport. Um, so some, some sports are more um, aerobically, you know, the demands are more aerobic. Some sports, the demands are more anaerobic. Um, so those are fueled differently um, in terms of carbohydrate needs, in terms of protein needs, in terms of nutrient timing needs. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of the, um, the gender component, um, we have to look at the uh, we would desire the female body to do in, in order to be healthy. So we need to look at um, how do we preserve menstruation? How do we preserve um, bone health? Um, for whatever reason, hormonally, um, genetically, et cetera, um, the, the male body is more, I guess, resistant to bone health issues um, because they don't have to sustain menstruation, prepare to, you know, potentially give birth to a child someday, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's just another layer of awesome, I think, in working with female athletes because it's another piece to to navigate and it's another piece to um, to to help them show like you can have it all. Like you can have your period, you can have your bone health, you can have your performance you can, you can have it all. And so I think that that's the big piece of working with female athletes. Um, obviously there's some extra stuff that we think about in terms of iron. There's some extra things we think about in terms of calcium, just to make sure that they can for sure have it all. Yeah. Um, so what is your relationship like with the coaches at Northwestern and do you feel like they help reinforce your performance nutrition plan for athletes and how is it, how important is it to have that relationship with the coaches? It's absolutely critical. I wish that I had another clone of myself so that I could hang out with the coaches even more than I do um, because they are such advocates um, for what we do. Their, their boots are on the ground. They have such a huge influence on athletes in terms of the things that they say daily or don't say daily um, in creating that positive behavior change or that positive culture around performance nutrition. I mean, there's just such a critical piece of what we do. I love the relationships that we have with coaches. I just wish that I could be in their pockets mm -hmm. all the time um, because I feel like we're, we're buddies, we're partners in, in what we're trying to do to care for our student athletes. Mm -hmm. Um, so you kind of touched on this a little bit, but what are the biggest challenges that you see for athletes from a performance nutrition standpoint and how do you help them navigate those? Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is, is there's so much noise um, in terms of um, nutrition being, being put on our, our elite athletes. Mm -hmm. um, they're getting advice from, everybody wants them to succeed. So everybody has their best interest in mind. And so um, they might be getting in, uh, information from parents. They might be getting information from back home coaches. They might be getting information from teammates. They might be getting information from um, a professional um, lacrosse athlete on Instagram. Like, here's what I eat. Here's what I do. Here's the supplements I take. They might walk into a store and be like, oh, you're an elite level athlete. Here's what you should do. It's like, oh my goodness, how do I navigate all this stuff? Who do I trust? It's, um, it's contradictory <laughs> um, sometimes. And I think that that's, that's one of the biggest challenges is figuring out you know, what you're going to do and then trust the plan. Um, because it's really easy, you know, to have a bad day or a bad week or a bad whatever, and obviously want to fix it. And nutrition is something that you have the grasp to fix right away. I mean, you can decide right after that practice, well, that sucked. I'm either going to A, recover and refuel my awesome body because I know that this is just one thing, um, one day, whatever, or B, I'm going to deprive myself because I must have eaten too much for lunch today. And that's why I was slow. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of noise. And I think figuring out what your plan is, finding somebody that you trust and sticking with it is very challenging. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I agree. Um, 
So how, kind of going off of that, how often do you see issues with body image and or eating disorders, especially among female athletes, and how do you help those athletes? Um, unfortunately, I see it a lot. Um, the research shows that we see body dissatisfaction in 80 plus percent of our female athletes and a very, very high percentage of our male athletes as well. Um, so unfortunately, I see it a lot. I think that there's, there's multi, there's a lot of reasons for that. I think that we, we have never been so exposed to fake bodies as we are now, um, fake bodies on, on Instagram, um, fake bodies in magazines. Um, I think that um, there's some misconception that if you look good, it's actually a quote from Deion Sanders, look good, feel good, play good. Mm -hmm. um, and the reality is, is that that's all messed up in my opinion, <laughs> that whole thing is all messed up. Um, so I see it a lot. And I think one thing to keep in mind um, that I've kind of learned from our sports psychologists is that nobody actually really knows what their body looks like. You know, everybody looks at their body and they don't actually see it for what it really is. And then they look at other people's bodies and they don't see them actually what they are either. And they actually did a study um, with people who had eating disorders and they had them try to draw like a life-size picture of themselves on a piece of paper and all of the people drew their bodies like dramatically bigger than what they actually were and then they had them lay down on the piece of paper they traced their bodies and they say no you know your body is actually this size it's really interesting that you see it looking so much different and so i think that what we really, really need to do is to get in touch with how our body's feeling. And then we need to work hard to honor those feelings. Like, are we having heavy legs during practice? Are we cramping? Are we having signs of dehydration? Are we progressing in our strength programs? Are we, because it's really like what's inside, what's going on is what we tend to, um, sometimes neglect for whatever reason. Athletes are really good at like grinding it out and playing through pain and doing all these things. And we don't wanna squash like your body's internal cues, um, telling us the things, telling us the messages that we really need to hear in order to, to be our healthiest, most high performing self. So I went off on a little bit of a tangent there. That's all to say that yes, this is this is a big issue. Body dissatisfaction is a really big issue. And if body dissatisfaction rules your nutrition choices, it's gonna be really hard for you to, to perform at your best. So what would be your main approach to helping an athlete that's struggling with that? Uh, unfortunately, um, it's not usually a quick fix. Um, there's multi multiple things that we have to look at ourselves. One is like, we need to look at ourselves and we need to go inside and we need to say like, I'm gonna work right here. And while all of this noise is happening out here, I'm, I'm right here. Um, recognizing the noise because sometimes you don't even recognize <laughs> that it's there and that it's playing such a big influence on your life. Um, I was working with an athlete um, last quarter about just what happens when you look at social media. Um, and it turns out that just, just looking at, at social media was bringing about feelings of inadequacy. I'm not enough, I don't look good enough. And then that was subsequently having, you know, impact on their next nutrition move. And they didn't even realize it was happening. Um, so sometimes it's, it's recognizing the noise, it's really cueing into like how your own body is feeling. And then I honestly think that it's committing as a team to saying, this is the culture in which we work. And when we comment about each other's bodies, good, bad, or otherwise, it's going to come at the expense of fueling and performance. Um, when we self criticize in our own heads, like that's going to come at the, at the expense of improved performance. Um, and so culture change is really, really hard. <laughs> There's a lot of things to it. Um, so I would hope that um, I would tell an athlete who is struggling with that to use their resources, find a sports dietitian, find a friend who aligns with their views on body positivity, um, and um, 
just create a good community and culture around yourself and delete every single following on social media that encourages you to do otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then another question I have is obviously like one of the main changes that can take place for an athlete, male or female, when going into college is just like putting on a lot of muscle because you're obviously training a lot more, you're lifting more weights. So how can an athlete maintain positive body image during that transition? Absolutely. Um, I think going into it, knowing that it's going to happen. I think having any sort of attachment to your high school clothing is unhealthy. I think you should just throw it away because every time, every time you put it on, it's going to be a reminder of the fact that your body has changed and you may or may not have good feelings about that. So I don't think, and I've worked with athletes who want to graduate from this place fitting into the same jeans that they fit in coming into this place. And I feel like that is going to come at the expense of health and performance. Um, and um, let's see, can you repeat the question one more time? Um, so how can athletes okay. manage muscle body image during that? Yes. I think the other thing is um, being very aware of how your performance is changing. And so sometimes that's really easy to do in terms of like, okay, I, on the beep test, I got this on the beep test, and then I got this on the beep test, and then I got this on the beep test, and that's in line with my goals. Um, or I'm lifting X, Y, Z, and now I'm lifting more, or now I'm lifting faster, or like whatever the metric is. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to put some metrics around ourselves that have nothing to do with how much our body weighs or how big our thighs are or small our thighs are or whatever they are um, and hang our hat on those metrics above anything else and the same goes to body composition as well I think that when people get into measuring body composition which they often have the opportunity to do in high school it's very easy to to buy into the um, notion that less body fat means faster um, or more fat is bad and more muscle is good or less muscle is good. I mean, people's minds go all over the place. <laughs> um, but I think that if you're hanging your head on those metrics and you don't have anything to show on the field, that's where your perception of, of what's going on gets kind of messed up. Mm -hmm. Um, so what kind of fitness and nutrition related language should athletes and coaches use and what should they avoid? And are there any kind of widespread myths that you see people thinking are true that aren't true related to fitness and nutrition? Yes. Um, I think some of the major language that needs to shift um, is just what we've been talking about. We need to talk a lot, lot more about performance changes and a lot, lot less about body changes and weight changes, et cetera. So I think that when somebody um, is having a performance issue, the language should rest solely on that performance issue and not extrapolate itself to, well, my fill in the blank, got bigger, smaller, et cetera. So that must be why. So if I fix this body issue, then my performance will obviously automatically get better. Um, I think that that is um, a language switch that needs to happen. We need to focus on behaviors that are in line with performance. So are we pre-fueling? Are we refueling? Are we getting half our body weight in in ounces a day? Um, are we getting our nine servings of fruits and vegetables? Like these are behaviors that are science backed, proven to associate themselves with performance. So before we go to, if I was only this weight, then I would perform. It should be, if I was only doing all of these behaviors related to success, then I would perform. It has nothing to do with the way that my body looks or what it weighs or anything like that. Um, I think another um, language switch around this that we could talk about is the fact that our body is going to change and that is normal. Mm -hmm. It would be very weird for our bodies not to change. They're going to change throughout our whole entire lives and that's how bodies work. It's awesome. Um, they change so that we can perform. They change so that we can rest. They change so that we can have babies. They change so that we can fight COVID. They change so that we can like do all the things and bodies changing is a really good thing. Um, so I think we need to normalize the change, embrace it, accept it, celebrate it, et cetera. 
Um, another thing I think that we could we could do better on with our language um, in terms of that is the fact that like because our bodies are always changing, there is this range that we currently live in. So like weight is not a singular number. Like if I am 160 pounds or whatever, um, if I am 159 pounds tomorrow morning when I weigh myself, um, which I don't weigh myself every day, but anyway, um, I haven't necessarily lost weight. Mm -hmm. You know, like it, 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 I exist in a range and I should not be celebrating nor being sad about changing in my body. Um, let's see, language, other languages. Um, I could go down a big talk about carbohydrates that I will probably summarize. Um, but I think that we have some really unhealthy ways of talking about carbohydrates right now. I think that um, some of the ways that we view sugar um, keep us from our best performance mm -hmm. because of something that social media told people of, that doesn't even apply to high level athletes. And now we have high level athletes restricting quick sugar before exercise that would really benefit their health and their performance. Um, so I think that high performance nutrition is not sedentary American nutrition. And if you eat like the recommendations for a sedentary American, then you are going to be a sedentary American. Mm -hmm. um, so some of those messages about, um, about carbohydrates, I would love to change the language around them. I would love to talk more about fueling um, using the carbohydrates versus restricting the carbohydrates and how we need to be careful about carbs and those types of things. I think we also need to be careful about the language that we use calling foods good and bad. Um, mm -hmm. Because in different scenarios, bad foods are good, good foods are bad. And if you call a food bad, then when you eat it, you're probably going to feel bad. Mm -hmm. And then what kind of relationship does that create with the bad food that you just had? There are a lot of scenarios in which treats, not cheats, are really, really good thing for our life balance, for our social life, for our energy intake that we really need. Um, if we always view ice cream and pizza and donuts and fill in the blank as bad, it sends us into this really weird relationship with our food. And then I would just say the, um, the treat versus cheat thing. Um, people have cheat days effective in, in putting anyone in the, in the weight spot that they want to be in, in the body composition spot that they want to be in, in the life spot that they want to be in. Um, and so I would caution against the use of that language, cheat because um, cheaters are bad and people that eat treats are not bad people. <laughs> so that's just kind of off the top of my head, um, some language recommendations that I would have. Mm -hmm. So of course we don't learn most of this information until we get to college because we don't have access to someone like you until we get to college, but are there any suggestions that you would have for high school athletes who are preparing to make that transition to kind of help ease them into it? Yeah, I think that there are some pretty good books available. Um, and so Nancy Clark's um, Sports Nutrition Guidebook is kind of one of the very easy consumable um, kind of items. Um, it's like $10. It's a very, I don't know if I still have it sitting here, but um, it's something that I definitely um, recommend. Um, to people looking to get their performance nutrition kind of underway. Um, there is starting to become some sports dietitians who are creating courses, like online courses for high school um, uh, athletes. So I think that, you know, that's been something kind of great that's come out of COVID is that a lot of dietitians are kind of pivoting a little bit and creating these virtual like online materials that I think that can be um, consumed by many. Um, you know, but I also think it doesn't have to be that hard. I think that putting a lot of energy in high school into body positivity mm -hmm. is going to serve 
anyone way more than getting your grams of protein and your grams of carbohydrates all squared away for your prefuel and refuel and your macros all in line with your whatever, because you're not going to do any of that stuff when you get to college if you are striving for if your if your mind is not right in terms of performance nutrition so honestly i would just put all of your effort into working on on having a positive body image um working on body positivity that type of stuff and then that solid foundation will serve you very very well and just obviously you know the other um you know general nutrition habits, you know, making sure that your plate is one third vegetables and one third protein and one third carbohydrates and you're drinking half of your body weight in water and you're eating every three to four hours and you're getting great sleep. Like do that stuff in high school. Um, start paying attention to how your body feels in different scenarios in terms of are you cramping? Are you running out of gas? Are your legs heavy? Um, you know, are you losing your period? Are you, you know, paying, paying attention to that kind of stuff? Um, and then the rest will come. Great. Yeah. And then if you could make one suggestion to all athletes, like if you had to pick one thing to tell them to do from a performance nutrition standpoint, what would it be? I would tell them to um, find your trusted source and delete everything else. Mm -hmm. Um. I just think that if you can, if you can control the noise, if you can find your trusted source, it's going to make everything a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And is there any one specific thing in like an athlete's daily routine of like refueling, refueling that you've seen make the biggest difference or any, on anything from a hydration standpoint? Um, what would you say is kind of like one of the two of the top things that you've seen that have made been small changes but made big differences for athletes. Um, this is a little outside the nutrition bubble, but it has to be said. It's sleep. You mm -hmm. have to sleep. You can do everything totally perfectly in the nutrition world, but if you're getting five hours of sleep a night, you're not putting your body in that anabolic state to recover and rebuild and get ready to turn it on the next day. So I think one of those two things absolutely has to be sleep. And I think the other you know, one thing that I would, I would recommend from a purely nutrition standpoint is to start taking a look at your plates. Mm -hmm. One third vegetable, one third protein, one third carbohydrate. I feel like that is going to lay the foundation for making sure that you are getting at least very close to in the ballpark of the macronutrients that you need, the vitamins and minerals that you need in order to perform and recover. The rest is just kind of like frosting. Yes. Okay, and then my last question is kind of a fun question for you, but what are your favorite pre-fuel and refuel meals if you had to pick like your mm. Okay, meals or snacks? Meals? Yeah, meals. <laughs> okay, meals. Um, I would say that my um, one of my favorite pre-fuel meals is um, baked potato bar. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think that you naturally make half of your, um, what you're eating carbohydrate. Um, if, if I don't have a lot of time between the meal and my exercise, then I won't eat the skin because it's too much fiber and I won't, that will not be good <laughs> for the run or the bike, or whatever it is. Um, but then you're also able to put some like really nice cooked vegetables on there. You're also able to put some like lean chicken on there. Um, so I would say that's probably one of my more favorite meals. Um, personally, um, I would say from our athlete standpoint, pasta is like always kind of a, a winner. Um, and so some variety of pasta with a light type of sauce, some cooked vegetables and lean protein is like what I would say 80% of our teams do some variety of that before their um, competition. So that's very well accepted. Um, and then a refuel option. Um, me personally, um, favorite refuel would probably be um, some type of like burrito bowl um, because, you know, it's, it's pretty well balanced, but also like it's hearty, it's warm, it's going to make you feel like full and satisfied and fueled and all of that at the end. Um, so it kind of has all the components in it, but it's also totally delicious. 
Um, and then I would say in terms of like what our athletes typically do for refuel, um, it, it honestly really varies a lot for our sports. I think some of our, our favorite sports do, um, or not our favorite sports, but like our sports favorite meals um, end up being something really easy that they can take on the go because they're always traveling somewhere after. So it typically ends up being like um, a grilled chicken sandwich with side of fruit, um, something just really easy that they can take on the go. Some people don't feel um, like eating a bunch after exercises because they've just like fully exerted themselves. So that um, kind of a light sandwich and some fruit and some cherry juice, obviously, and some fair life chocolate milk or whatever, um, t they tend to do pretty well with that. Great. Well, thank you so much. This has been really helpful. And I think a lot of athletes will really benefit from this information. So thank you, Katie. Absolutely. Great to see you.